So um, this is, uh, the thing is, getting up in the morning and doing a crap job, I just think is the most depressing thing I can think of doing in the world. And that's 300 hours a minute. It's 300 hours of shit uploaded to YouTube every minute, most of which will never be watched. I mean, look, you know, my mother might watch my daughter dancing around in the kitchen, but the rest of you have no interest in it at all. And so, you know, doing anything half assed is really easy, right? You know, just being on autopilot, not thinking about it, getting up, coming to work, replying to some emails. Is that even the most important thing you're supposed to be doing? Is there not, you know, having no meaning in, in what you're trying to do? Um, and this is one of my favorite things. This is, he was a, uh, Sturgeon is a, uh, uh, He's a sci-fi writer, and he, now this is Sturgeon's Law. 90% of everything is crap, right? So there's, and, and actually in coding, there's another term in, in developing software, which is, you know, 90% of the time it takes to write 90% of the code, and then the other 10% of time takes another 90%. Um, and so, but, you know, can you, can you imagine being so depressed? You get to 89%. You know, you put in all the effort. You don't just sort of do it half-hearted. You actually go and try a bit but it's still crap and nobody notices. Because the thing is, nobody notices unless you're in the top 1%. You know, think about the things that you use, things about the things you notice, things about where you shop, where you're prepared to spend more money, and it's because you've decided it's in the top 10% of stuff. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I work, uh, with, I run the marketing team at IMR and run marketing at some of the other companies I've been at. And we create content. And the reason that most of that content is crap it's because we don't consume content. Nobody says, darling, let's go into the lounge and consume some content. <laughs> Nobody down the pub says, mate, you must watch that content. It's fantastic. It's books, it's articles, it's TV, it's things which create some sort of emotional engagement. And yet most of the stuff that gets churned out is blah, 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 blah. And it's just so dull. And I'm sure the people who wrote it didn't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to go to work and create some of the dullest crap available in the world that nobody will ever read. I mean, they'd want to kill themselves, wouldn't they? So it's just about having, trying to raise the bar, trying to think about what it is you're trying to do and trying to do it to the best of your ability. Um, so to me, this is all really straightforward. I, I think you have happy staff, you have happy customers, you make more money. I'm in the private sector, they're making money, but it's important. For a lot of companies in the private sector, the other two things seem to be strange. They start with making the money, but actually, if you, don't, if you start with making the money, you're going to make all the wrong decisions. I think it's impossible to get great customer service from people who hate doing what they do. And if you've ever rung up a call center, and the guy at the end of the phone picks up the phone, and he's, you know, he's having a really crappy day, you, know, you get asked loads of stupid questions. You repeat yourself several times. And then once in a while, you get the guy who says, I think what you want, Mr. Monkhouse, is a new phone. And you said, exactly. And he says, just bear with me. I'll answer you a series of questions. If you just say yes to them all, I'll be able to give you the phone you want. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. No problem at all. He's filled in. All, he's worked out how to get past the, the, past the IT. Instead of saying, it's not my fault. It's the system. I'm not allowed to help you. He's worked out a way to fill in all the forms and still give great customer service. Um, and so in, in, um, one of the things I like to do is if I find something that works, I am then amazed that other people then f pretend that it doesn't exist. So this is, this is a gents urinal at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. And the guy who architected Schiphol Airport, that's, it's, a, it's a poor picture. I did actually take this. I didn't steal it off the internet. That's a fly. So he used to be in the, he used to be in the uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch army. And he realized in the Dutch army that in the gents urinals, they used to put a red spot in the urinal because it reduces splashback, because gentlemen are, if nothing, habitual, and if you give them something to aim at, they will, and then that reduces your, uh, your, it reduces your requirements to clean up. And so that's one of the things he did in Schiphol Airport when he got to design it. And if you do a new office building, you can do that, and you can put, you know, you can put your, your competitor's logo embedded in the urinal, if you wish. Um, but actually, when we did, uh, we did an office at Pier 1, uh, and we had unisex toilets, so, you know, each one, actually the ladies made me change that because they said the blokes were just messy. So anyway, we went, but what we did is we put a ping pong ball in the toilets that the gentlemen would use uh, so that we, we could take something that we'd seen somewhere else and adapt it. And so that's what I love doing. Henry once said to me, I'm a magpie. I just see good ideas and then I just have to turn them into something. 
And so I, I'd seen that before this book was published, but this is one of the things that's in Nudge, and it's that just how do you gently get people to do what they want them to do, you want them to do without actually making them do it, or even them even noticing that you have a hidden agenda. Um, and so I've got, I've got a load of books that I'm going to cover, because the thing is, you, you know, I'll speak to you for about 20 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever. Um, but then some of these are books that I've read in the last 12 months. And so this one I thought was interesting, and I knew I was coming here, so I, I went looking for a book about hierarchical organizations, knowing I was coming to talk to an audience in the public sector. Um, and so General Stanley McChrystal ran the, uh, the coalition forces in Iraq. And at the time he took over, there was a massive bombing, and he realized that the coalition forces in Iraq had no way of dealing with al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so he said, he said, I'm going to set out and I'm going to build a new coalition. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to change the organization. I'm going to come up with something that can be as fluid and flexible and as responsive as a terrorist organization. Um, and one of the things he thought about is he thought about the US Army in particular. And he said, OK, so we've got the Rangers and we've got the SEALs. And the SEALs know that the Rangers are idiots. And the Rangers know the SEALs are idiots, even though they're on the same side. Even individual SEAL team units think the other SEAL team unit, they're, they're not in are all idiots. And so that's how the military works. You know, you're in your platoon, and your platoon is great, and everybody else is an idiot. And so that really got in the way of understanding how they were on the same side and what their mission was, because they were great, but everyone was an idiot. Um, and so how do you overcome that, and how do you take that and build some trust? One of the other things he looked at was real-time information flow. And so you know, one of the things that had already come out was post 9-11, you know, they knew that lots of people from Saudi Arabia are in the US taking pilot courses. And that seems really odd. Somebody wrote that and submitted it. Um, so all the information was there to not have had 9-11, but nobody was sharing information because the CIA didn't share information with the FBI and different field units because people, people have their own vested interests. Um, and then he does, so there's a whole sort of real-time data sharing. They had open, they got rid of all the offices. They just had an open plan space where all of the various people from all the various teams spent time and worked together. And every, every week, they had a two-hour conference, which was like 30,000 people from around the world. Who were, who, and people were briefing all of these, briefing in real time. And then, you know, just sort of the, the whole satellite imagery, drones, real-time information flow, sharing with lots of, lots of people. But one of the things which, uh, you know, so that was, if you like, that was the organization he started with. And this is the organization he ended up with. So these are the teams, and it became sort of teams of teams. And I was struck that, you know, how could you as organizations, you know, do something with that information? Well, you've got the opportunity to be office-based or open plan. I don't have an office. I haven't had an office for a long, long time. I hear lots of information that when I, if I'm in my office, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what was going on. Um, I wander around, I talk to people, I move my desk around the organization, I sit next to different people. One of the other things I've done in the past is every two months or three months, I make everybody move seats. We pick up the whole office and we move everybody around. Because that's what we had. We had people in finance who didn't speak to people in sales and the people in marketing knew the people in sales were idiots. And the developers didn't talk to anybody. So, but developers make more tea than ever, you, you drink 15 cups of tea a day if you sit with the dev team. Um, so what we did is we moved people around. The other thing is that if you hire new people into your organization, they go on the edge. They get the crap chair. They get the crap laptop. They get the table that wobbles. Right? So that's really great for them. They're new, and you treat them specially. Um, but if you're moving people around, you can't create cliques. You break it down. You know, I remember the first time I did it, somebody said to me, I can't believe you've done that. You've sat me next to this bloke. He's an idiot. And after a week, they said, you know what? I didn't know him at all. He's actually all right. And so, you know, what well, in the end, I think the way, the, way I've, the way I found it works best is put people in teams. That's where, they all, that's where they're all sitting today. Pick them up, mix them around. You can either be deliberate and put ne people next to people that you know have an issue, or you can make it random. You can get people to pick it out of the hat. You can, infl you can inflict it upon them. But then do it for a little while and move it back again. The other thing which is interesting is that if you take a... Take, Take you ladies there sitting on your desk. If you're at work, what you will have worked out is that to do your job, you need to know six people inside your organization. And because you sit at a desk, you all know the six people you need to know inside your organization to do your work. You've got six different people that you know. And you've got six different people you know. So if you pick you up and move you around, 
you might end up with 18 people you know. But the person in finance that you thought you knew was the best person isn't the best person. And it's that building this sort of neural network inside your organization can, be hugely in, can have huge influences on productivity and, and breaking down um, tribal knowledge. Um, so ask yourselves this question on your tables. What is it about your organizational structure that gets in the way of you doing better stuff? Discuss. Um, so, uh, another book. Uh, this is the guy who's head of HR at Google. Um, and so, the first one, Bring Your Mother to Death, Mother, Bring Your Mother to Work Day, is in the book, but I'd already done it years ago. I remember I'd hired a load of graduates, you know, straight out of second job, not first job, because first job. They haven't worked out, you have to get out of bed and it's too hard. So second job, they work that out and, and they turn up every day. Um, and, I, and there was a five or six of them and they, or, I don't know, the boys, the boys didn't want to bring their mothers in, but the girls did. And their mothers came in and we created email addresses for them and they all baked and then, you know, they had their nails done and, you know, we got them, a, we taught them about the internet. And it was fantastic because people, you know, people are proud of where they work. You know, if, they, if you have a sense of pride in what you do, you know, it's, I think that's linked to engagement, it's linked to effort, you know, it's linked to meaning. Um, and if you, had a, if you in your workplace said, right, we're going to bring our mums to work, and nobody came in, it would give you a strong sense that nobody really gave a shit about who you, who, what you're doing, where you're doing it, where it is, no sense of pride. Um, pay unfairly, I'll, I'll do that in a second. Focus on recruitment. I, I, think, I think the only thing I ever get to do is hire people. Um, I think, you know, either it's been a startup and you've got to try and create the first 50 people inside the business and that's incredibly, you know, powerful and that then the next 100 you add on, ta on top of that are because you've got solid foundations. Or I go into an organisation where there's some change needed and bringing in new people who share uh, an idea of what the future could look like or, or what the transformed organisation might be like because they've been in something similar. Uh, is incredibly important. I probably spend two days a week recruiting. I do all my, I write my own ads. I do all my own screening. I do all my own interviewing, because it's just the number one thing that I do, and I can't delegate that to anybody else because they don't know what I know. You know, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell, ten thousand hours. I must have spent twenty thousand hours interviewing people. Um, I don't know that I'm any good at it, but it's absolutely critical to me, and I don't want to blame the fact that we got the wrong people on anybody else. <laughs> And hire better people, hire better than you. I mean, you know, it's been attributed to lots of different people, but I know Guy Kawasaki says at Apple, people said A players hire A players and B players hire C players. And, and you know, you, you find an organization and they delegate, they delegate recruitment down and the place is full of assholes in no time at all. I mean, it's just staggering. Or you go into a company where that's been allowed to happen. It's so hard to turn it around. Um, and meaning. I won't touch on that at the moment. But this is interesting, right? So people think skills distribution is like this. And, and it might be if we're thinking the Industrial Revolution and our job is to work in the factory for every waking hour of the day, right? So if we're packing widgets in a box, I might be able to do an average number of widgets in a box. Henry might be the world record holder of widgets in boxes, but he's probably no more than 2x better than me, right? The power law is how it happens if you do anything with cognitive ability, right? So if I'm an average computer programmer, the best might be 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times better than me, not 2x. And therefore, if I'm on 40 grand a year, the best guy in the world might not, we might, 80 grand a year might not gain. It might be 150, but for 100 times the productivity. I know this is a stretch in the public sector. It's a stretch in the private sector, but I only tell you because it's one of those things where, you know, one of the things I have to do is I have to try and find, it's a bit like, you know, being in championship three. And at some point, I'd like to get into the premiership, but I've got no money. So I'm going to have to build a sales academy. I'm going to have to hire people out of university, and I'm going to have to try and find people who are going to get me up here. And I'm going to have to try and keep a hold of them as long as possible. And so I've got to invest in people, I've got to invest in talent, I've got to develop talent. Because I, I can't afford to pay more than one and a half X for my best person. 
So I've got to find people and I've got to develop them because I know if I can get really, really talented people, my organization can be so much more efficient than the competition. Um, and so that's just one of those things that I've found out along the way that, you know, it's really hard. You've got to work hard at that. I mean, in the past, I, had a, I worked for a company where we would hire practice managers out of GP surgeries and turn them into salespeople. And then they would get jobs at Microsoft and double their salaries. So the best I could hope for was to find somebody and have them for two years. But that two years was better than trying to find a salesperson on the same sort of salary. You know, so if, if, if along the way, what you, what you require from the talented individuals and their development path overlap for a couple of years, that's fine. I mean, this isn't about hiring people and jobs for life. This is about putting people into an organization and driving some energy and some spark and some output. Um, and so that's one of those things. Um, the other thing I do is I get people to, well, I, I do some psychometric testing stuff as well, but one of the things which is really cheap and easy to do is I get people to draw pictures. So I, I sit them down, and for the first 10 minutes of the interview, blank sheet of paper, packet of pencils, I leave them in the room, and I ask them to draw what motivates and inspires them. And then I come back in, and I spend 20 minutes talking to them about their picture. Um, and this is a good one. You know, um, this person is into leading teams and conquering objectives and having plans and being outdoors and sunshine and happiness. Um, some of them have been awful. You know, no, only once in 15 years has anyone produced anything of artistic merit. So it's not about can you draw, right? And actually, I read something recently where somebody said, actually, if, you know, maybe the reason that this works is because people aren't expecting it. And when you draw, you can't lie because there's something, you know, if you've prepared for an interview and you've got used to doing interviews, but you tend not to have to put your thoughts on paper. And so what I'm after is I'm after people who, I'm trying to get past it when, you know, I look at a CV and it says, uh, you know, hobbies, socializing with my family. I mean, that's not a hobby, that's just being alive, isn't it? I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a sense of people who've got something. Did somebody do, people, I want to know, I mean, I don't care whether you go roller skating or whether you're a DJ, I don't care what it is. I just, I want you to be passionate about something, not just nothing. Because I think if I hire dull people, there's no way they're going to be less dull once I've hired them. You know, um, anyway. Um, I, I talk a bit about um, um, meaning. And, and actually, lots of organizations have value statements. This was Enron's, uh, and so it didn't work out too well for them. Um, and I think that's absolutely critical, having a core purpose. You know, why are we doing what we're doing? And, and trying to get the organization to understand you know, and it's not making money, because that's, you know, making money for the shareholders. Nobody ever got out of bed in the morning and went, yes, I'll rush to work and make more money for the shareholders. But, you know, at least, you know, Brendan, you know, in your organization, when you spoke before about, you know, the people in your organization and what they're doing and why they're doing it and how your new construct gave them an opportunity to carry on doing it, rather than have that work done by Crapita employing people who don't care. You know, it's that, um, you know, it's, it's huge. Uh, and that's been one of the key things that I've done in, in, in the organizations I've been in, is try to create meaning and values that make sense to, the, to everybody. Um, two questions to ask about every employee. Knowing what you know about them now, would you hire them again? And if they resign tomorrow, would you miss them? And if you can't answer yes to both those questions, you already know that this is the wrong person for your organization. You just haven't had the balls to tell them yet. And that's on you. And so that is absolutely critical because the organization is about who first, not the what. So, you know, it, you can't work out where you're going if you haven't got the people you need with the right information, you know, who share your vision, who share your purpose, who, know what, who, who are with you and want to do what you want to do. See, first of all, you've got to say, have we got the right people? And then you turn to those people and say, how do we get there? Because we know what the destination is. We know what we're trying to do. We know where we're going. But until you've got the right people, trying to get them, trying to go the wrong place with the, the right place with the wrong people, it's just impossible. You're just pushing it uphill every day. Um, and the brutal facts, you know, so many times in organizations, people aren't honest about how crap it could, how crap it is. You know, people... People pat themselves on it's this sort of it's that 10% thing again. People say, well, we're better than everybody else in our industry, or we're better than most people in our industry. They're just trying to be nice to themselves about the organization. And you've got to be frank and brutal about what today is, because you're trying to plan where you're going tomorrow. 
And if you can't be honest about it, what you do is people, it's like customer satisfaction surveys. 97% of our customers didn't hate us. And then when you do net promoter score, you realize that actually the people who gave you seven and eight were neutral. Only the nines and tens liked you. The sixes still hated you. You know, so most customer satisfaction surveys are completely pointless. You know, all they do is they just make you feel happy with mediocre. And you've got to get into the top 10%, otherwise you don't, you don't move people. Um, and the flywheel, it's really hard. All this stuff, culture, you know, movement, change. You've got to push the flywheel. You've got to lean into it all the time as leaders. It's just that's what you do. And that's why hiring different people or um, supporting different people in the organization. One of the things I've done in the past is I've sat down for lunch with everyone who's been in the organization for less than six months. Because I don't want them, you know, if I've been there, if I've been in a company for a few years, most people will know me. If you're new, you might think I'm the managing director, I might not have hired you, you might not know me, but I want those new people to feel loved. I tend not to celebrate the people who are leaving. You know, there's, in most companies I've worked at, there's been the great escape. You know, there's a big party when somebody leaves and people say, if you get, when you get there, if they've got a job, tell me, I'll come with you. You know, it's celebrate the new people, celebrate where we are today, don't celebrate the people who are leaving. But that flywheel thing is just hard. Um, so at Pier 1, a couple of lessons from Pier 1. Um, not everybody makes it. So you hire people, you hire the first five people, you hire the first ten people. Everybody in that organization had the opportunity to be a director of something. Of the first ten, probably two of them made it, but not everybody else did. That sometimes means that they're miserable or they're envious, um, but you've got to be straight and transparent with people. One of the biggest things that we did uh, was around development. So we took the executive team, which was 11 of us, off-site every quarter for a week, and we didn't talk about the business. We just talked about our relationship, because there was nothing more important in that business than the relationship of the people who ran it, and some of those people on that team didn't make it either. Um, and one of the biggest things that we did is we brought in a rule called no triangulation. So if Kathy comes to me and says, Henry, eh, 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 that's triangulation. I join in with Kathy and I say, oh, let me give you my 10 pennies on Henry as well. The thing is, neither of us are talking to Henry, right? And so what we did at Pier 1 is we said, right, no triangulation. So if Kathy comes to me, she could rant. That's fine. I could say I can understand you ranting, Kathy, but I'm not prepared to get into it. But if she then carries on, I'll say, look, that sounds like you have a problem with Henry. I'm going to give you 72 hours to talk to Henry about it. And if you haven't, I'm going to check in with him anyway at 72 hours. You'll have either spoke to him or I'll tell him what you said. <laughs> Boom. No gossip. No bollocks. All goes. It's really hard. People fall by the wayside. But that transformed the organization from the executive team. And okay, we didn't get, we weren't perfect all the time, but it was, a, it, it was an intent about changing the way we worked, just the way we worked as individuals and the human beings, rather than anything else. And, and that made a huge difference. Um, we spent a modest amount of money transforming two, a derelict pub and restaurant in Southampton, down on the town quay into something that other people said was the best office in Britain and as good an office as Google and Sun the Daily Telegraph. The first two weeks we were in there, we had camera crews and journalists in the building every day for a fortnight. We put in a slide, uh, we put in a pub, we put in a cinema room, and we did it all on a really tight budget. Um, and that actually made us an employer of choice in the area. So people would come and say, I really want to work there. And that had a huge impact on our ability as a small company to attract the most talented people in the area. We'd run job ads. And people, people who'd seen our PR knew who we were would recommend us to a friend to a friend. And that meant we got massive bang for our buck. Um, something else. This is a, hasn't come out very well. This is a picture of naked people. Um, so if you don't tell your staff what to wear for work, they don't come to work naked. Right? So you don't actually need rules for most stuff. So uh, one of the things that I find about job ads... Yeah, 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 it's about job ads. No, no, no honestly, I, I've got one more slide after this, Henry, that's all. Um, so if you read a job ad, and, and this is in, the, the, I think, the last chapter in this book, and so they save the best to last. And, if you're, and, and to me, because recruitment is so important, it's, it's a fundamental lesson. So what you do is, if you read a job ad, it normally says something about the company, blah, 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 something about the job, what we're looking for. And in this, he says, if you went on a date and you did that, particularly if you're a bloke, and you just talked about yourself for the first third of the date, it is unlikely that she would still be sitting there at the pudding course. 
And therefore, what you should do is you should try and say, because your ideal employees are somebody who's in a job, doing what you want them to do, and they're very good at it, but they're a bit frustrated working for your competitor. And you really want them to come and do it for you. And therefore, your job ad should be, these are the frustrations our star performers no longer have, because they now do their thing better where we are. And it transforms the number of replies you get. You get fewer replies, but you get better replies by writing a job ad specifically for the type of people that you're after, as opposed to saying, please apply for this job, anyone can do it, you don't need any qualifications, as long as you've got the right attitude, you're in. Right? And then you just spend years sifting through all these people who have no idea. You know. Also, don't ever read a CV if you don't get a covering letter, because they can't really be asked. So just delete them straight away, and then you only have a third of the CVs you receive to read. It makes life much easier. Um, I'll finish there, shall I, Henry? <laughs> Well, this is the last one I did, uh, and, it, and this is something that uh, I've worked in organisations with disparate workforces, uh, or even in this organisation, we're all in the same office. But, you know, um, quite often people can have a bad day. And so I was thinking about your nurses in the, in, in the, in the sticks. And so this would go out every Tuesday from me, and people had, it was, it was, you could reply for 24 hours and then it was dead, and basically people said, how are you? Happy, sad, happy, sad, uh, and picked it up from Chief, ha Chief Happiness Officer, I can't remember his name, um, Alex, yes. It's in, it's in his 9 to 5 happiness book, uh, where he says happiness at work is your responsibility, not your employer's responsibility. But it's fantastic. So I've, you know, I've been on the other side of the world, and somebody's pinged me back and said, uh, and they just pick the phone up and say, what's up? And there's just something driving them mad. And they just know that it's a, the ability to take the, sort of the pressure valve off and that, and that you care. In fact, sometimes people will go, eh, just to see whether the system works, because they were pretty sceptical when it got rolled out the first time. Um, and so again, it's just, it just connects the top to the bottom of the organisation and gives people a sense that, you know, things that we do, stupid rules, you know, things that happen every day, how do you just take the pressure out of the organisation and keep the people that you want to keep um, and not the people uh, that you don't? And I'll finish on two more books. One, which I thought was fantastic, uh, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, uh, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. It's about, it's about how you can hold an inconsistent thought in your head. Um, and the other one about multipliers, how the best leaders make everybody smarter. And there you are, two books to read. Thank you.